You're listening to Start Writing, where we explore the great minds behind the greatest stories. Hosted by Joseph Bendosky, author of the Skyfall series, and Jay Washburn, author of the Star Child Space Opera. Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Start Writing Podcast. Today, I'm excited to introduce Kevin Sinclair. He writes Lit RPG, which I had heard about, but before I read his book, I'd never read the genre, unless you count Ready Player One. God of the Feast was a blast to read, and it's a wonderful introduction to Lit RPG. You also may learn a thing or two about the genre in this episode. Before we start, let me point out a couple things to look out for in our show today. First, at one point, Kevin says, I don't believe in criticism. And I find it interesting that this is a theme I've heard from several authors on this podcast, and it's certainly something to think about. Second, it's cool how I came across Kevin's work. And I tell the full story in the episode, but the short version is that the same narrator performs his Creation's Bane series and my Star Child series. And, by the way, I'll soon publish an interview with our narrator, the spectacularly talented and phenomenally British Simon Wright. Okay, third, Kevin has a fascinating story of success that came from the COVID lockdown. He comes from humble beginnings, and now he is quite successful just a few short years later. It's almost a fairy tale. Fourth and last, Kevin has a phenomenal accent. I believe it's called Sunderland. He's from northern England, not far from Scotland, and you can certainly hear the similarities. Having said that, I personally listen to podcast episodes at a very fast speed. And if that's you too, you might want to slow it down just a bit on this episode. Okay, I'll ramble on no more. Here is our episode with Kevin Sinclair on what is Lit RPG. Hello. Kevin, how are you? Not too bad. Can you hear us okay? Yeah, you can hear you hear me? Yep, super. Okay, excellent. Uh, how's, how's your day going? Yeah, okay. Just running around as usual, trying to get some words in, in between you. Yeah, excellent. Uh, good. I, I mean, just I've begun, just hasn't it? gotten up mostly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so <clears throat> normally I start with questions. Uh, actually, it's all basically questions. I, I just want to tell a quick story to you and to our listeners. So I was looking for an audiobook narrator. And I mm-hmm. I had a bunch of them, and so Simon was one of them, Simon Wright. And so as I would find a narrator who was a candidate, then I would go listen to one of their books. And this didn't happen for most of them where I would listen to the book, and I'm like, well, the narrator's good. I'm not sure I love that story, though. But with yours, I was just like, you know what, man, this story really clicks for me. This is so much fun. Um, so it was God of the Feast that I listened to at, yeah. kind of as an audition for Simon. Um, mm-hmm. and so the, the other thing is I had never read, I, I didn't really understand the lit RPGs genre. And so that was another yeah. perk. I was like, I, I want to listen to this cause I want to understand lit RPG. So anyway, mm-hmm. I was blown away by your book. I loved it. And I, I thought Simon did a great job too. So the first question I love to ask is tell me the story of your name. Um, and for some people that means what their name means. Maybe it's who you're named after, or maybe it's a story of kind of how you've built your name since you've and living but yeah tell us the story of your name kevin sinclair um there's not really a lot for kevin just just the name that my parents decided to give us there's no as far as i know there's no history i think in the 80s his parents did uh if they wanted it to begin with a k a kick and k because my sister was called k so that's basically the the first name the second name is it's a Scottish name from the Highlands of Scotland. Um, <clears throat> and 
it's from Sinclair. I have done a um, Clan Sinclair. I have done a little bit of history and traced my roots back to, um, I think, the Shetland Islands. I, I got back to in the 1740s, but that's as far as I got. Tell, tell me, where, where did you grow up and what was it like growing up there? So I am from Sunderland, which is in the northeast of England. It's sort of it's not far under the Scottish borders. Um, it's a it's a nice enough town. It's quite it's a very sort of working class, blue collar. Um, we had a lot of heavy industry here, shipyard buildings, um, and a lot of mines, which are closed down. Sort of the eighties. So there was a lot of depression in the area growing up. Um, but certainly interesting, lots of colourful characters to uh, um, inspire and help to create some um, cool characters in my own books. Mm. Um, so I, I'm actually curious about this after having read God of the Feast. Uh, are you... well? I love the buddies there, you know, Clive and he has his, his pals. Mm -hmm. Is that inspired by your own buddies and uh, your own gang of friends? <laughs> um, not, not so much. Um, it's more, it's just a sort of a amalgamation of everybody I've sort of met along the way, you know, like you'll just pull out, like tease out certain character traits of some people like some you know extra grumpy people or aggressive <laughs> people or whatever and um, thinking of funny moments and um, i've spent sort of well, must have been about 18 years on building sites here okay. sort of working in construction um so a lot of that comes from that sort of the banter and uh, the way some people communicate uh, in certain scenarios. So, yeah, thanks. a lot of that. That's cool. So <clears throat> I'm curious how you, when you were a boy, how you first made money. And then when was the first time you made money writing? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I sort of I tried to go through the traditional education route and I managed the first year in university where I, I did philosophy oh. and then I just sort of with all the money that it takes to be a student and everything else, I ended up just coming away from that. Um, and I, I always aspired to be a writer then. And I'd, I'd sent a few, like I'd sent a fantasy novel I'd brought around the time away for submissions and got nothing back. And then I, I started a family, just needed money and, um, and I just ended up me me father's a plasterer. Mm. Um, are you familiar with plastering in America? It's uh, more and is it, it's more dry lining, isn't it? Well, yeah. I was wondering, Do is you, it drywall? Is it like anyway? Yeah, go ahead and tell me. <laughs> yeah, it's um, well, it's a it's sort of wet plaster, so it would be like back to bricks or on old lat plaster. Um, so like a full like traditional sort of plaster and that, okay. that we use here on the brick houses um so really yeah i just did that for well probably from about 20 to 37 mm -hmm. um and i don't think i'd i'd written anything from being about 25 i just stopped writing everything i was just exhausted all the time just looking after the family <laughs> um working um well, so can I ask, but I've always, as a plaster, you're doing manual labor. Does that give you a lot of time for headspace? So you're thinking a lot and, I mean, doing your philosophy? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. It's, it's a very repetitive job. Mm -hmm. um, hard but repetitive, just the same thing again and again. Um, I found I found audio books. I don't, I, I've always read, but I only ever read paperbacks. And I sort of, I, I stumbled onto Kindle ah. and e-books in about 2015 and then audio books about a year later and sort of having audio books around that time, sort of playing all the time, like the, the, like the days just flew by. Um, 
and it just that started getting it back into us again, like you know that I could do this. Listening to some of the stories, I'm like, you know, it might take a while, but I could write that. <laughs> I could definitely write that. Oh. Uh, so yeah, and then COVID happened. Yeah, 20, March 2020. And I think about the second day of because all the sites had closed down in England. Um, about the second day. I'm going to do it. This is, there'll never be a better opportunity now to do it. So that would be the first time I've made any money with writing. Mm. That in the March, I started writing. I think I finished the first draft in about 10 days. Oh. I was just like, I was just ready, ready That's to do crazy it. crazy fast. <laughs> um, the, the set, to be fair, the second draft took about two months. Mm. And then we edited it. And... I made my own cover. I, um, are you familiar with GIMP, G-I-M-P uh-huh. there? Yeah. Yeah, I, I downloaded that because it was free. I made my own cover, um, and then I I didn't pay for a professional editing. I just did it myself, and my wife helped us. And then my wife was like, it's not ready, and I'm like, I'm doing it. <laughs> and then in July, I just, I just published it. But I didn't know anyone at the time, and I'd literally just like, I just like looked around like how to self publish. Hmm. Um and I left it up for a month and it for me it done amazingly well and I made four hundred dollars in a month. Um but a lot of the feedback through the reviews was it's not <laughs> brilliantly edited. Uh-huh. Um and I met some friends as well, some other authors, and they said, Kev. The cover's awful, mate. You need to get rid of that cover. They still take the Mickey out of us now. They still like have a laugh at this cover now. Um, so I actually I pulled it down. It was Condition Evolution. I pulled it down. Oh. I like I took it off. Um, and if you change ten percent, like over ten percent, you can republish uh-huh. as a second edition. Yeah. So that's what I did. Um, I, th- I think it was at about 60,000, and I literally got it to about 66,000 um, <laughs> on a rework. But I'd, I'd made it better. I took in a lot of, like, I think I had about 18 reviews and feedback from other sources. Mm-hmm. Um, and I made it better. I had it professionally published and, uh, sorry, edited, and I got a professional cover. Mm. And then went again. Dang, I really want to see um, your old cover now. <laughs> oh, God, it's awful. Um, <laughs> Uh, well, man, so I don't know how to find it on me. Laptop. You've you've come a long way, and I mean, it's not even that long. But you just have stellar covers, a stellar lineup. Uh, that's that's kind of, that's cool here in the beginning because I I can see where you are now, and that that's just a fun story. But yeah, oh, I mean, it's been it's been crazy. Sort of, it was that that little spark, like oh, people are going to read this. They're actually going to read it, and some people some people hear what I write. <laughs> Um, but some people genuinely love it, and I just have such great feedback from like from people from all over the world. And so this is it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. And I've li- I literally I don't think I've stopped writing since. Mm. Um, like every day, like morning to night, like when I had to go back to work, I, like I've been able to stop working now. But for I think that was it halfway through 2022 I stopped working. Um. And it's literally just getting up at five o'clock, right until about eight o'clock, going to work. Or now I take the kids to school, mm-hmm. um, and then I'll be writing till about nine or ten o'clock at night every night. Dang, yeah, that's impressive. So let me shift gears for a second, and then I do want to get back to your writing. I want to ask you about RPG. Um, mm-hmm. So again, I. I didn't know anything like I didn't understand the genre until I read your book. Your book's really the only one that I've read from lit lit RPG. Mm -hmm. Um, But I just want you to pretend like I I don't know what that even means lit RPG. And just tell me like what it explain this genre to me. So initially it was the idea that you would be inside of a game of some, description that that seemed to be the way most people went with it originally but it's kind of progressed and developed from then where it may just be an alien planet like where sort of where statistics hmm. physical statistics or um, abilities are noted down 
So it's not, as you, as you probably know from my book, it isn't actually in a game. Mm-hmm. Um, there's no, there's no game really about it. But I suppose what's really cool about it, and what a lot of people really like about it, is the sort of the marked progression. So in, in any fantasy, you know that a character is getting stronger as they're learning and they're becoming whatever it is that they grow into. So it's it's kind of a progression fantasy with statistics and numbers and notifications to just sort of like give you that um, give you that something always that you're reaching for. Yeah. Um, Man, and, and I think that's that could be what makes it addictive for a lot of people as well. Yeah, I, I was just noticing as I listened that it was uh, the progress is very notable, and and so you see him level up, and it's just like, well, this is exciting. This is the new level, and so yeah, it's interesting yeah. how that how that plays into the reader experience. But, yeah, I mean, I hadn't read any until. 2017 it was mm. it sort of I just came from like a I mean mainly historical fiction fantasy and sci-fi just all the classics and um I read tons of Joe Abercrombie Bernard Cornwell oh, um, cool. and th- that's sort of where I came from um and then I just found it and I just like I said like so addictive to read and so <laughs> generally quite fast flowing and huh. um entertaining cool um did you did you play D as a kid or any particular rpgs um i had played a couple of times later on sort of when i went to university i had a a few games and i have played warhammer huh? with my eldest son and a couple of my other sons are just starting to get into it now and um, but mainly through computers, so playing games like Skyrim and um, Fallout. I think Fallout's probably uh-huh. my favorite uh-huh. um, game, but yeah, just that sort of thing. Cool. Um, did you see the new D and D movie? I did. Yes, oh. we went to see it. So I I haven't seen it, but I'd love to hear your review of it. it just a quick hey. review, you know. <laughs> I think it was just genuinely good fun. It was just well made. Very good fun. There wasn't anything to lose your interest, huh. and it just it just kept coming. Some good laughs, some funny moments. Um, yeah, and just and it, it felt like a D and D campaign mm-hmm. in the like in the sense of the silly things that happen and like uh, everybody's roles to play uh-huh. and backing them roles up as they go through. Yeah, so, yeah, I, th- I think. I think every, everybody was worried about the film. They really were. Like they were thinking, "Oh God, this is going to be another absolute travesty." <laughs> but on the whole, I think like most of the people I speak to, they're really happy with it. Yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, I'm I'm excited to see it. So, yeah, it's worth a watch. Um, and did you say you went with your son, or or? I did. Yeah. yeah okay. Cool. And so when you're saying you're playing Warhammer with him, you're you're talking about tabletop, not video game, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Huh. Yeah. So I I know about Warhammer. I, I know a lot about these things, but I I'm not super. Like I, I've played a D and D campaign like one time, and anyway, so yeah. I'm still learning I'm about it. Yeah. But so now I, I'd like to ask you some questions about Podium. So you initially were an indie author, like when you published Condition Evolution, that that was all on your own. And yes. from what I understand, Podium is doing your audio books. Are they also kind of publishing your ebooks now too or no, t- tell me about your no, relationship that's all self-published yeah oh okay yeah no um ebooks are entirely self-published um i think podium are always sort of on the lookout i had a few issues with doing the audio on myself mm-hmm. um on condition evolution to the point that i've only got audio presently to book five but I'm on the book seven in the series. Um, and it was just, it was just difficult, like a whole difficult process. And it was, it was taken as away from what I needed to be doing. I mean, I'm sort of, I'm trying to write books and keep producing books, but I need to sort of build the business aspect up of it as well. And um, everything that goes into that. 
in the audio it it's expensive to produce yourself um you really need like decent audio editing um and basically just people who know what they're doing with audio mm-hmm. and i didn't and i was relying on the guy who did my first series and he was very good he, he got the editing done and everything but it just kind of ground to a halt in the end and I didn't produce audio for my second series for this one I thought I'm just going to give it to the experts it wasn't even about having it published per se it was about I just want to give it to somebody who knows what they're doing Uh and so is was it Podium who found Simon for you no, I found um, Simon. I, I listened to his work on the Renoir's um, series, and I thought he sounded brilliant. Yeah. Um, and it's just a really good, really good choice. I'm over the over the moon with what he's done. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite character that he brought to life? I guess. Uh... Um, I. He did brilliantly with Clive. Hmm. He really did. Um, yeah, the Sunderland is so fun. <laughs> oh yeah, he's he's really went with it. <laughs> um, no, I think he did the. I really think he did the notifications very well, mm. and there was a bit where they sang, mm-hmm. and I thought he just really, really like absolutely nailed that. It like really elevated the book, in my opinion. Yeah. His little um, they're singing in the dwarven tunnels. Mm. Yeah, it's super cool. He's so talented. <laughs> he is. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to ask. Uh, I'm going to ask what are the pros and cons of working with Podium? But you can just do pros. I I don't want to undermine your relationship at all. But so tell us the pros and if you want some cons. And the reason I ask this question is, our listeners are authors and there are people who mm-hmm. might want to do how like follow your route and so just any advice or, or thoughts about your experience would be awesome yes i i genuinely don't have any cons with podium so far it's just sort of been a perfect experience that that is coming from having tried to do it myself and really appreciating <laughs> what they do and having to try and find the money and you know if the series doesn't perform straight straight away you as an indie author you and just starting out you you really need to see a return quite quickly don't you I'd, I'd sort of say three months and i would be expecting to have a return on whatever i'd spent i would need to have a return on whatever was spent um full time so literally being with Podium just takes all that away because they're paying for the narrator and they're paying for the editing and everything and the making sure it's a clean product to go go on. So, and it's just that you don't have to. I mean, I'm glad I have learned what I learned doing it myself because then I know sort of what's going on yeah. when using Podium. Um. But yeah, really, it was right now. It's the best decision I've made mm. because it just frees up my time to do everything else that I need yeah, to do. Yeah. Um, I I don't know if you can talk about your contract, but how do you how do you split earnings with them? I can't actually remember. <laughs> um, it's a it's a round. Uh, I can't actually remember what I'm allowed to see as well. Okay. Yeah. What I'm not you, yeah. I don't to want to get you in trouble. So that's fine. <laughs> it's, um, it's okay. I'm happy with it. It's, um, I mean, you'll, you'll know that through Amazon anyway, you only receive 40% if you go direct. And yeah. if you go wide, it's 25%, which just seems like a pittance. But then going through the process with them, I never know what's happening anyway because. There seems to be a sale on every, like literally every month. There's a different type of sale on, ah. and most of the time it just baffles us what you're earning and what you're not. the mm. The books are going on for, I think, God of the Feast is sixty three dollars for the audio book, uh, uh-huh. 
But then, obviously, you have the credits, which are nine ninety nine or whatever. I'm not sure about the um, on your side. So it's it's all very confused. It's like forty percent of what? Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I've had that same frustration on on the Kindle side. They'll tell you like, this is your book's price, and this is how much it sold for, and they'll even take a little a few cents out for this is how much it cost to download it. And it's very clear. And then you go to the Audible side and it's like, I have no idea what money is coming through. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's crazy. I mean, that's, that, that is part of it. And doing it independently as well and sort of doing it through ACX when you come to sort of the tax mm -hmm. of doing it as well. And you've got to work out, or if you pass it to an accountant, which I have now, you've got to work out every country and everything related to it yeah. and then the bank charges and sort of it just gets so <laughs> mind-boggling <laughs> um, but you'll you'll know yourself mm -hmm. like, oh, and, and, and that i suppose a lot of that is why i went with podium I, I mean i'll be honest from my perspective when i got into it i wasn't thinking about it um audio books it's almost just an additional bonus. Mm. Um, so it was always all about the ebooks for me. Mm. Yeah, cool. Well, so can I ask you, I, I'm actually a little surprised to hear you say that. Do you know what the split is? Like what percentage do you sell of ebooks versus audiobooks? Um, I'm really not sure. It's... Mm. I make a lot more from ebooks. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Um, so I just know that Brandon Sanderson recently said that he sells like 75% audiobooks, which is a shockingly large percentage. But That is huge. Yeah. That yeah. is. Um, I, I, I'd seen a lot around Brandon Sanderson and <laughs> Audible lately as well. Yeah. Yeah. Man. Yeah. That guy's skyrocketing. <laughs> Well, I think I've I've read nearly every Brandon Brandon Sanderson book, and I've only listened to one of them. Oh. So the, the, those figures are not quite right for yeah. me. Yeah, yeah, interesting. I think I I think I bought Oathbringer on um, audio. Uh, That's the first one. Uh -huh. Yeah, dang, cool. Okay, so I want to hear about your cover art. So you started in GIMP, and now you have these fantastic covers for Creations Bane. Uh, Tell me that process. How did you get such great artwork? Um, I think it's just sort of being in the community and asking around who has done what. My covers for Condition Evolution, I went through 99 Designs. Mm -hmm. Are you familiar with that yeah. site? Um, and I'd heard a lot of horror stories about it, but I found a great artist. I think he was Indonesian. Huh. Um, Eco, Eco Pute was called and he did all the Condition Evolution covers and he did my Sesmiel Accord covers um, but then he had, I think he had a lot of work on and they were starting to come slower and taking longer to get and a little dip in quality as well so I thought it was time to move on but I think his covers just for the front were about $199 and I think it was closer to 300 for the back as well. Huh. The sort of full wrap. Um, and then I've went with in Argentina, uh, Argentinian artist, um, Luciano Filatus. And he's quite a bit more expensive. Mm. Um, but he was brilliant and sort of so colourful and like, coming alive and I really felt like his characters jumped out of the page. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great way um, to describe it. <laughs> yeah, they, they really do. But he's also had a lot of work on and I've moved again for the fourth one. And oh. I'm used I'm using a British artist this time, an English artist who sort of lives, um, I think about two hours away from where I live now. Um, and I found him on art station huh. and that's a great place to look for artists. Um, oh. it really is. Um, but he's done the fourth book cover on creations being, I don't know if you can see yeah, it, but yep. it's, 
and it's coming out. It's different, but it's. Uh, I think it fits in well with the. Yeah, I think it's awesome. I think all of your covers are sweet. <laughs> Um, so well, they say they say don't read a book by its cover, but that's almost what the covers are for at the same yeah. time, isn't it? It's, yeah. it read me. <laughs> um, so when when you do these designs with them, do you make suggestions and say, well, you know, <clears throat> so the first one, I mean, has Clive and his sword, and then like a demon. Do you describe that, or do you tell them to read the book and they just take it, or like how how does that come about? No, I'd, I'd be surprised if. Any of the artists have read any of the books, <laughs> but I do describe it. I, I give them as much detail as I can. It's always awkward, isn't it? Because I'm, I'm not an artist. So it's sort of like, I want Clive fighting some demons <laughs> or a big demon like guy. Um, and then it will be just sort of description of how he looks in my mind. But what I tend to have had is that sort of give us a couple of very rough mock-ups. Um, I might even provide a rough mock-up for them, but mm. I mean, generally they are absolutely awful. But <laughs> they give us a couple of rough mock-ups and then I'd say like, oh, I like the direction you've gone with that. Huh. We'll go with that. And then they'll sort of add a bit of colour and more detail and say, are you happy with that? Do a couple of little tweaks. And then that's normally it. It's normally maybe three times mm. we are back and forth, but... I think when you find a good artist, you can trust them, can't you? It's yeah. sort of like, like you know so much better than me what <laughs> you're doing here. Well, and I thought I read, did you have someone separate do the typography? Is yes. That, yeah, so tell us about that. Yes. <clears throat> Stephen Landry is a fellow author. He does a lot of um, sort of sci-fi lit, RP, um, lit RPG. But this, this was all new to me. At the... The first covers, the artist did them both, but apparently that's not common huh. for the sort of when you're employing, I don't know, an artist. Hmm. It just sort of came to new, came as news to me. Was, oh, so who's your typographer? <laughs> I don't know. It's just the guy who did the cover. <laughs> um, so that that was that was news to us, and it increases the cost, doesn't it? It's like, yeah. oh right, so there's something else to add on. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> but they do a great job and you can see a difference. You can see somebody, it, it almost is like a different form of art. Mm. Um, so I do appreciate what they do. Yeah. yeah. A lot better than I could ever do. So <laughs> happy to hand it over. <laughs> yeah, cool. Yeah, it's, it's excellent work. Um, okay, I want to ask you about your writing process now. Um, and I'm going to start with a question that I hate getting asked and I'm going to see how you answer it. <laughs> um, how do you come up with your ideas? I'll, I will start with a premise and a character. So for Clive, uh, sort of, I, I knew I wanted to write a portal fantasy. I knew I wanted it to be epic. I wanted gods in there. I wanted demons and as many fantasy creatures as I could fit in, you know, like, but sort of my, my take on them, like how I sort of, how I would want them to develop. And really it's then just sort of taking a character, what I really wanted. In my mind, I had a little bit Gordon Ramsay for <laughs> Clive. Like he was sort of That's running something. in my mind a little bit. <laughs> Um, so I kind of, I just like had that sort of mindset. So we're going to take not Gordon Ramsay, but like that kind of like quite brash and confident and determined, but not necessarily perfect or right ever. Um, and we're, and we're basically going to put him in a fantasy world. And then I, I sort of, I wrote the scenes where it was. The begin the, the beginning scenes, and his friends just kind of appeared in my mind. It was sort of like you would try and get a message to someone, wouldn't you? Mm -hmm. If that was happening, you would try and get a message. Who would you get a message to? How could you? So it was. It just kind of followed that that idea because I, I always end up bringing lots of characters into me books. I can't help it. Um, people 
people to bounce off. Hmm. And it was that, and I don't plot. I'm not a plotter at all. I just do a, a vomit draft. I just, hmm. I just type, and I just write little notes down if I think like, oh, I need to go back and change that. But I'll never go back and change anything. And what tends to happen is. I'll hit a wall somewhere. It might be at like sort of 40,000 words, 60,000 words. It's never more than 60,000 words. Mm. And once I hit that wall, I sort of go, right, I need to find a way around this thing that I've, I've gotten myself into. And that's when I'll do my second draft of that sort of first section. Oh, huh. So I'll just stop. <clears throat> I'll, I'll second draft that. And as I'm going, I'll know that I've got this problem coming and I'll sort of find solutions and ways around it huh. as as we're going along. Um, and that's working really well for us every time. So I sort of, I get back to the point I was at. I've normally got a lot more words added on by then. And then I just go again off, just type and type as much as I can. Hmm. Um, well, so no, that was... yeah, a couple follow up questions. So, do you have a word count goal per day, or I- any particular way that you keep pushing so hard? If I'm not in the editing process, I I aim for ten thousand a day, mm. but and I have had periods where I would reach that ten thousand a day. Mm. Um, but I sort of, I've been writing so much, so regularly. I think it was around this Christmas because I got of the uh, creation Spain has, I think it's like a million words in it so far mm. on like the first four books. And I just kind of hit a wall. <laughs> then like I just, it, it wasn't right as block. It wasn't that I didn't have ideas and it wasn't that I could still write. But suddenly from probably averaging about 8,000 words a day, I just dropped to about four to five and I couldn't pick it up. I couldn't make it like the call anymore (laughs) and any faster, which I mean, four to five is reasonable. And I'm, I'm, I'm really happy with that. It keeps us going. It keeps us producing. But, um, yeah, I I think it was a little bit of burnout that you hear so much about, but, um, yeah, I aim for 10 and normally hit about eight. Okay, cool. Um, so I, I'm very much an outliner. Well, and, and it's not like really detailed outlines, but I, I definitely have a structure for where I want my story to go. So it's cool hearing this other perspective. Cause it's kind of, I mean, you've heard on our podcast, we've talked about gardeners versus architects, but people will, will say plotters or pantsers. Um, mm-hmm. anyway, yeah, I, I just think it's really impressive what you're doing, like how quickly you're rolling this stuff out and, uh, yeah, I always, I always sort of think that, in a way, that first draft is a plot. Mm-hmm. Like, if that makes any sense, it's sort of that is the plot, and it's still highly fixable and mm-hmm. sort of changeable. But if you were going with like the true sense of what everybody normally sees and means, I had no idea that that was going to happen at the end of God of the Feast. Mm-hmm. What happened? <laughs> that just developed as we yeah. went along. There was no way. I don't think there was any way I could have plotted that. Mm. And the, God knows where my mind would have had to be to have gotten from where I started to how I ended the book. Um, but I like that aspect of it. I like the going through the adventure myself almost mm-hmm. and sort of, you know, how, how would this, how would this happen here? Um, I don't, I don't do a lot. I don't worry a lot about any sort of form or structure as I write. A lot of it, a lot of my first draft as well is it'll go from, I'll start from the beginning and work through, but I will, a battle may come where I'm particularly excited or a conversation and it'll be really detailed. There'll be so much to it and then they'll be traveling to somewhere else which is for me like relatively dull mm-hmm. to sort of write and it'll and then they were there 
and I just miss out all of that. And in my second draft, I have to sort of flesh all those <laughs> portions out and add that layer that detail on. Um. So, oh, uh, so if you don't have an outline, well, you don't have an outline. So, how do you know when you reach the end of a book? Like, does it suddenly strike you like, oh my gosh, this is the ending, and you just kind of realize, or what's that like when you get to the end? <laughs> I can on a on a first draft I can sort of never finish it and never finish the end and I'll never have that ending down. So maybe I'll I'll sort of draft that right up to the end and I'll have an idea about what I want to happen in that ending, but I'll not quite write the ending. It'll literally be like the last like two chapters or something. I'll not write it. I'll just put a couple of notes of mm. how I think it's going to end. Um, and then sort of I'll drop back again with the second draft and I'll come through and I'll build to that end and I'll bring in everything that I sort of need to uh, make sure it's as dramatic as possible. Do you, I mean, for me, it's vague. I, I can't really say how many drafts I do, but do you have a specific number of drafts or times that you go through a manuscript? Um... I would like to see a three, mm. but I tend to do a lot when I'm going through editors. Well, I do three before the editor gets it. And so it's literally the first draft, my second draft. And then I like to go through literally just fine tuning it. And more specifically, I like to focus on how people are talking because I do a lot of dialogue. Um, and, you know, often it, so. There's a dark elf queen in God of the Feast. And I'll look through and it's like, well, she's talking like Clive. <laughs> she's, it, it, we can't have that. She's supposed to be a regal dark elf queen. So like, we'll, we'll change that around. And just basically that for all of them, sort of. I spend that little bit of extra time trying to get into the head of each character to make sure the dialogue works for them. Hmm. So that, that's pretty much it, the third draft. And then off to the editor's. Do you, uh, I know that when you're creating a fantasy world, it can be very complex and it's easy to forget things. Do you keep some kind of a story Bible that kind of keeps that all straight for you? Yes, it's very, very basic. It's normally just a page of notes. Um, I have all my stats on a spreadsheet because uh -huh. they're particularly quite difficult to, to keep track of. But Generally speaking, I've got the maps and a few pages of notes. Hmm. It's not a lot. And I make them sort of as I'm going through it. Okay. And so I listen to your audiobook. Do your books have maps in them or is that just for you? No, the books have maps in. Oh. I haven't quite worked out how to get them into the audio books yet. I think there is a way. I know there's definitely a way, but I've not oh. brought that yet. It's something I need to do. Okay, cool. Man, yeah, I love a good fantasy map. That's cool. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. Um, so you mentioned your wife, I think. Did, uh, well, my question is, who beta reads your work? Who, who's the first person or first people that give you feedback? <clears throat> I have started using Royal Road. Oh. So God of the Feast was published entirely on Royal Road. Um at that third draft stage. Mm. So how that tends to work for me um, is that I would, let's talk, when I've said that I might get the 60,000 words and then I'll drop back, mm -hmm. I sort of, I'll do that and then I can post it chapter by chapter, day by day. I do sort of five chapters a day. Um, and Patreon as well. I use my Patreon now for that and they get ch five chapters a week. Mm. Um, and that does that does come in quite handy. Hmm. So that's sort of where I'd say like the fine tuning on that third draft really comes in. So on those drafts, they'll not get that. You know, they might have Queen Denevra talking <laughs> like Clive a couple of times. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the that would probably be it. To be fair, the feedback isn't amazing though. 
it's normally just people chatting about the chapters and what happens. Um, generally, that would be about it, though. I've never really used a lot of beta readers, only arc readers. Um, I suppose I'm just writing the story that I really want to read and mm-hmm. if people will like it. I mean, the editors will see if anything's been repeated or needs chopping out. Um, but that, that's about it, really. Yeah. I don't. Um, I, I don't believe in criticism too much, <laughs> and I, that sounds that sounds crazy. But I'm, I'm just very. Um, I think you can criticize. I think it's very easy to criticize anything. I mean, uh-huh. I could sit here and criticize Lord of the Rings if I wanted and like tear it apart, but I love the book. I like it. Like it deserves to be uh, where it is. Um, it's the easiest thing in the world to criticize unless it was some, like somebody very experienced. What I tre- tend to find is if there's something that's recurring, a critique that you see in again and again, like oh, this character's really whiny, your main, your main character's really whiny and 10 people out of 15 people have said it, <laughs> you'd be like, mm, maybe I need to reduce his whininess a little bit. But if it's sort of one out of fifteen or two out of fifteen, I just think, well, that's that's personal preference. Yeah, yeah. And it's always going to be that way. Not everyone's going to like what what you write. Huh. Thing that's cool. Honestly, I kind of feel like that's a personal lesson that I am learning that criticism, I think, can be damaging, or it, it can, like like you're saying, you could stop enjoying Lord of the Rings because you're becoming a critic. And that would just mm-hmm. be sad, you know. That that would be a shame. So absolutely, yeah. That's that's cool. That's I love that. Okay, I'm going to ask you like six or eight rapid fire questions. I assume you'll your answers will be short, but uh, you can make them long if you want. But <clears throat> yeah, we'll get to you. if you had to pick one book, one of your books to be a movie, which one would you pick? It would have to be God of the Face. To mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Definitely. <laughs> Um, paper, ebook, audiobook, or podcasts? Which 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 is my favorite? Uh yeah, I mean it's it's purposefully vague, but <laughs> yeah, pick pick um, one of those. <laughs> I never thought I'd say this, but now it's probably ebook. Cool. What was that like a tricky transition for you or Awful transition. I refused for so long. I refused. Um, <clears throat> the only reason I did it was because I, I was reading oh, Peter Brett, The Demon Cycles. Okay. I, I'm not I familiar, but yeah. And I got to the end of the third book. I'd, I'd bought three paperbacks like oh. quite cheaply, and I got to the end of the third book. It was early on at night. I knew I wouldn't be able to pick it up. I went on Amazon to buy it, like to have it delivered. And I've always seen the Kindle thing there. I was like, no, no. And I thought, you know what? Let's give it a go. And I've never looked back. Oh, it's really? just amazing. It's uh, you've got you've got it everywhere. If I'm waiting for somebody like to pick somebody up, there's just a book there. You've got a whole library everywhere you go. The only the only thing I don't like about it is a paperback Landing on your face when you fall asleep at night <laughs> is a lot softer than a phone. <laughs> and I've done that a few times. Oh, that's hilarious. <laughs> so do you read on your phone and not on a Kindle or something like that? No, just on my phone. Yeah, me too, actually. But yeah, cool. I actually, the, the funny, when I started in lockdown on writing again, we only had one laptop and it was pretty much broken. Would had it for ten years, so I wrote the entire first draft of Condition Evolution on my phone. Whoa! So were you dictating we're, mostly or using thumbs? No, no. Type it, Google Docs. Hmm. I wrote it in the first draft entirely on my phone. That's crazy. <laughs> and then we we bought a new computer, hmm. um, just to edit it because it's impossible to edit on your phone. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, really it all, challenging. It all goes. <laughs> huh? Dang, that's awesome. Uh, what's something you're looking forward to? Um, 
finishing a series because I haven't done it yet. Mm. Um, as crazy as that sounds, I've I have conditioned evolution to a point where it can stop, but it has the p- potential for like a sort of next section. Huh. Um, but I'm sort of I'm looking forward to finishing a series. Huh. Um, I will be finishing God of the Feast in six books oh. if I get it. I always plan for six books but where I'm at with the four, fourth book I'm sort of like I'm going to have to see how book five goes because yeah. I might finish it with book five. Oh, really I thought you were going to say the opposite where you might add a book but wow that's interesting I, I'm always pushing when I write um, I'm not really the kind I'm not really a sort of I don't really go down the garden path, so to speak. It's a, always a always a push. So Clive's sort of really advanced in book four. Mm. So I, I just don't know. There's a lot of threads to tie together. There's a lot of things going on across the entire galaxy. Um, <laughs> so we will see. Okay. But yes, I think this year it, it's potentially finished. Hmm. Dang, that's exciting. That's pretty cool. Um, what does work life balance look like in your life? Awful. <laughs> Just truly awful. Um it is I see I, I get up at I try to get up at five most days. I have periods where I'm not doing that, but my general idea is get up at five, which I do. I probably do about fifty percent of the time. And then I'll write until eight o'clock when I take the kids to school. Um, I try to walk to the school. So it's like an hour and a half of walking and then sort of get back. I will write entirely through until I pick them up again. Mm. Come home, cook tea, see everyone. (laughs) And then about six o'clock, I'm back on the computer until nine o'clock. Dang. That's amazing. Uh, right, uh, right. That's pretty impressive. Wait, so you're walking to school. So like a 45 minute walk one way and then back. Yeah. Yeah. Dang, that's cool. <laughs> well, it's the, it's the only exercise I guess. <laughs> well, yeah, man, walking is pretty good for you. So that's cool. It certainly is. Yeah. Um, what book? Oh, well, sorry. I already know this. I, sorry. I wrote all these questions and now I'm just like reading my, <laughs> The question is, what book are you working on now? Which uh, I think Creation's Bane Five, right? No, it's it's actually not. Oh, I agreed happily to do a joint universe with a few other authors. Mm-hmm. So there's four of us each writing two books in a shared universe. It's a cyberpunk wow. um, universe. So my my book surrounded a an orc gangster, basically <laughs> somebody who's fallen out of the army and they're building their way up within this cyberpunk city. Huh. So that's what I'm writing now. Um, and we're, we're all posting that on Royal Road and our patrons as we go. Hmm. So that's to be produced in August. Dang, that's cool. Well, I'm, mm-hmm. I'm glad I still asked the question. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you never know. Yeah. Um... Is there a name for that series? Do, have you guys gotten the title for the series? Um, the universe is Autumn, the city of Autumn, okay. but it's just sort of called Autumn, R-T, you can't have again, R-T, no, E-R-T-E-M. Okay. Sorry about yeah. that. Okay. I had a senior moment. <laughs> yeah, we all do. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay, what book are you going to read tonight? I'm currently listening to Beware of Chicken, mm. which is a, it's a, a cultivation book narrated by Travis Baldry. So I'll be listening to that. Huh. Um, and I have a few books that I'm reading on Royal Road as well. Uh, I'm reading Mist Runner, which is a cyberpunk. Huh. And I'm also, I'm also reading the other author's books who were writing the universe alongside me. So, so much reading. Uh, Yeah. That sounds like a lot. Yeah. I I, I cut off at nine o'clock working Mm -hmm. and then I'll read for an hour before I go to bed. Dang. Yeah. That's cool. Um, what author do you look up to? Uh, 
Um, my favourite all-time author was David Gemmell, but he's dead now. So I don't necessarily look up to him. <laughs> he's, he's, he's not with us anymore, but brilliant author. Um, after that, I would say Joe Abercrombie and Bernard Cornwell. Hmm. Cool. Um, t- so I don't know David Gemmell or the third guy you said. Tell what what is a famous book from each of those two? David Gemmell, the uh, so my favorite from what he wrote was um, his debut novel was called Legend. And it's about a axe man called Druss. Um, mm. But there's a whole series um, following that particular axe man. But absolutely amazing, heroic fantasy writer. So the best I've ever read of that. It's really, really good books, really empowering. Um, it's just like so much fun. Bernard Cornwell has his historic fiction. Okay. And he's wrote, have you heard of The Last Kingdom, the series on Netflix? Yes. Uh-huh. He wrote the books of that. Okay. Um, and that, yeah. Sharp, have you ever heard of Sharp, the TV series with Sean Bean? Uh, yeah, I have. Uh-huh. Yeah, he wrote those as well. Okay, cool. So he's been around a long time. Huh. Yeah, sweet. Okay, I'll have to check him out. Uh, my last question is, what is the one book that has had the greatest impact on your life? Wow, <laughs> quite the question. <laughs> I was going to see a David Gemmell book, and then I was like, but what about Lord of the Rings? And then I saw I loved Asimov when I was younger as oh, well. Cool. But I'm going to go beyond all of that now sort of where I live reading isn't that prevalent like mm. not you know it's not really a common pastime um for a lot of people it's kind of seen as a chore almost mm-hmm. it's kind of seen do you know do you know what I mean yeah. it, um and I didn't want to read for ages as a kid and I remember I was 10 years old and my dad had bought us books for Christmas because my dad likes reading and he's always trying to get us to read and I <laughs> opened them up books what do I want books for <laughs> and I, I think I was just really bored one time it was like about a month later and the books were there and I started reading the point sci-fi there were um, can you remember the point sci-fi books I don't know them, no yeah it was just sort of like loads of different authors um, and it was a um, first Contact, it was called. Huh. And that was the first book I read because I wanted to read it. Oh, that's and cool. I just never stopped after that. I read that book. I went and found the next one. So it was about five in the series. It Dang. just never stopped. That is so great. <laughs> that's a good answer. <laughs> um, okay, so if if someone wants to contact you, I know you're on Twitter and that's in the show notes and I'll put your, your website in there. Do you have a preferred way that people reach out if they want to? Get in touch. Um, I'm I'm on Facebook. I'm easy enough to find under my name. Um, my email. Uh, they they are the main ones, I think. Okay. Really. Okay. Yeah. Um, email or Facebook. And then, so I'd like to give you the final words, and that that can be an invitation to buy your book, or it could be you know, a request, or it could be a piece of advice, uh, or it could, maybe there's a question that I should have asked you, but I didn't. Um, anyway, I'll, I'll let you, let you wrap it up. What, what do you want to say? <laughs> um, I suppose just if there's anybody there who's had like the, the dream of writing, even if they're not sure, even if they've maybe not had the, like, what is perceived to be the necessary education to write. Mm. Um, we're all storytellers and like the main thing is if you're having fun when you're writing people are going to feel that when they read it they're going to have fun with you with it and you can the you can add so much on with the sort of second drafts and third drafts that's where like the real polish sort of comes that's where 
where you look intelligent as a writer comes from, isn't it? Where you've got the the experience of hindsight, and then you 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 know you can get decent editors for a reasonable price to really sort of help you along in the process. And if it's something you want to do, I would absolutely recommend like mm. that you just do it. You just sit down, have fun, and write that book on your on your phone, whatever you want. <laughs> Google Docs, it's free. You can yeah. just if you can type a text message, you can write a book. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Kevin, thank you so much. This has been a real pleasure. I've enjoyed chatting with you. Well, thank you for having me. And to our listeners, it's time to start writing. Tyranny rules the galaxy. Tyveros has crushed every hint of rebellion. Like the grip of his cybernetic hand, he maintains a relentless hold on the populace. The power he hates most is the psionic magic of the song. A force so strong it flows out as light from the eyes. People with such powers are called radiances, and Tyberos's witch hunters kidnap any that surface. As the radiances slowly vanish, so does the galaxy's hope. Till Kalet White Sun, one of the last radiances, gives a risky speech denouncing Tyberos and the extermination of her kind. The message spreads across the galaxy like the light of a supernova. She becomes revered as the uncrowned queen, the one with the power to finally unite the people. And then, doom falls in the form of the crushing hand of Tyberos. He captures Colette, sentencing her to the darkest dungeons and imminent death. All hope is lost, until a lone pilot appears, a pilot who wants nothing to do with Colette or her rebellion, yet who may in fact be the galaxy's last hope. A pilot whose ship, the Sanctum, was created by an ancient alien race. A pilot who stole that ship from Tyberos himself. A renegade pilot named Starchild. Get the Starchild paperback, ebook, or audiobook at starchild.jwashburn.com.